I would like to introduce the person who put this uh, together, and she will introduce the speaker. So, uh, Dr. Michelle Lauren. Good evening. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, the reason why I decided to first put these, um, our original panel together, which we did last year, uh, had to do with the fact that, uh, well, even a couple years before that, I'd seen students, even students who were not particularly excited about reading, would come into my classes reading while they walked. I'm usually used to seeing that with like texting on the phones as they're entering the class, but th this was the, the book of, of the Hunger Games, open, reading while they walked, reading until the moment I started uh, giving the lesson, and then if I took a break in the middle, they'd open the book right back up, and they would just, couldn't seem to put that book down. At the same time, um, I, I noticed other students who had, who had just finished the last book tearing through the other two books in the series of The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. And I realized that this was something, I, especially when we as professors are often faced with students who express dismay over um, being made to read a number of pages. And here are people absolutely devouring. And it's, it's, the three books are about a thousand pages. Um, and they would, they would devour them within days or weeks. And it was quite clear to me that uh, this was something worth following up on and really building upon because this was something that the students themselves had an interest in. So uh, last uh, year, in conjunction with the opening of the uh, second film in the series, uh, we had our first Hunger Games panel. Uh, and we are reprising that event again this evening. Uh, so uh, the new film on the Hunger Games that will actually be coming out, um, it's the first part of Mockingjay, that will be uh, coming out this Friday, uh, is, will be opening at a theater near you. And then because they just couldn't get enough of the Hunger Games franchise, uh, rather than just making the three films from the three books, there will be a fourth film that will be released next year. So who knows, maybe, maybe we'll be here more or less uh, same time, same place next year, uh, giving you a further update on what the Hunger Games really means and how we can really get um, the most we can out of their meaning. Um, so at that, um, on that note, what I'd like to do is I'd like to go ahead and pass the microphone off to the first of our three speakers this evening. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Mark Hibben. And he's going to be looking at this, appropriately enough, being from the political science department, from the angle of political science and how government and, and particularly uh, authoritarian government is expressed in the Hunger Games uh, novels and how then that relates to those governments here today. So Dr. Mark Hibben. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, I'm not a uh, Hunger Games nerd, so if you, you know, if I don't say the terms quite right, just you know, take it easy on me. I know people get a little uh, shirty about that kind of thing. Uh, so if I don't say Panem quite right or Snow, I don't know if there's some kind of other way to say it. But anyway, so my presentation is looking at the relationship of authoritarian rule that and and some of the dynamics we see in in the first couple of Hunger Game movies uh, around President Snow. So again, as a even though I'm not a Hunger Games nerd, I'm a political science nerd for sure. So you're going to get a little bit of education around maybe more topics in terms than maybe you wanted, but that's okay. Uh, so the, the first thing to think about is why even be concerned about authoritarianism um, in today's world, right? We live in a democratic society, and I, and I think at some level take a lot for granted, right? Uh, none of us have to worry about indefinite detention, last I checked. Uh, none of us have to worry about not having a trial by jury, right? Uh, last I checked, also, it doesn't matter who's going to get elected, that person doesn't have the right to put you in jail, okay? But that's not the case for a lot of the world. Uh, authoritarian rule remains the mode of governance in the world, and about six out of ten people live here in 2014 in places where there's some vestiges of authoritarian rule, sometimes very harsh, sometimes a little bit more benign, but it's there. So I just wanted to first kind of put out a, give you some context of this and, and look at, at what we see. By country, and this is 2014, this is a 
think tank in Washington called Freedom House, which looks at various factors of how free a society is. And we can, you can look at the website there if you want to get more data on how they come up with these terms. But large scale here, about 45 countries are considered free today. About 55 countries are not. And when we do that by population size, we even, it gets to be a little bit more uh, dramatic. As I said, about 40% uh, of a global population is free. About 60% is partially free or not free. So about, you have a, if you're born anywhere in the world, you have a 40% chance of living in a society similar to ours. But the odds are not in your favor, speaking of the Hunger Games, right? <laughs> so that's something. And also just to look at this somewhat uh, geographically, again, anything in purple or yellow is either unfree or partially free. Anything in green is free. So we can start seeing some regional geographic differences here, right? So if you're born in the Western, if you're born in the Americas, overall your chances are a bit better. Uh, obviously, if you're born in Africa, the Middle East, or Asia, uh, I don't know, you know, maybe, maybe you, you're born into a democratic society, maybe you're not. So this, this is important to think about as we look at the Hunger Games and authoritarianism. So one thing about uh, authoritarianism and democracy is often there's a very simple, uh, if you haven't really thought about this a whole lot, often we think of democracy uh, and non-democracy, and that's the two categories that we look at. But it's a lot more complicated than that. Authoritarian regimes have a lot of diversity. And political science spends a lot of time looking at that, that you can have authoritarian regimes that are just awful all the time, right? And you can have authoritarian regimes that are pretty decent most of the time, right? So there's a real diversity in authoritarian regimes. Uh, so I wanted just uh, t uh, some myths here to think about as, as we talk about authoritarian regimes. First of all, non-democratic regimes are not, are, the myth is that they're all the same. As I said, very different. That, also, non-democratic regimes never deliver. Well, look at China, right? China has brought millions of people out of poverty. It delivers at some level. Um, it delivers in an autocratic way, but it delivers at some level on certain metrics. Non-democratic regimes are de facto illegitimate. It's not the case that if you're not democratically elected, you don't have legitimacy. There's, there's reasons you might have legitimacy. It might be hereditary. Uh, again, you might do a good job with the economy. So it's just something to think about, that there's a real diversity in non-democratic regimes, and that non-democratic regimes are always unpopular. Again, I, I give you the China case, or even Russia, right? Russia under President Putin, uh, even though he's not well-liked by the West, pretty popular in Russia right now, overall. So this is something to kind of think about in the context of the Hunger Games, uh, particularly when we get into this idea of totalitarian versus authoritarian rule. Another important thing to think about in all this is the energy that a non-democratic ruler uses to, to keep control of people, right? Um, totalitarian versus authoritarian rule is, is one of these really interesting dynamics because totalitarianism seems to be something that really is tied to the 20th century and none other. It's kind of fading away in the 21st century and it really didn't exist prior to that in a, in a in really, in, in, in the data set of, of governance. So let's just kind of look. Here I have Hitler on the left side as a totalitarian leader, right? And I have over here General Pinochet, who was a former uh, dictator in Chile. And what I'm doing here is to kind of look at the difference between totalitarian and authoritarian regimes in a broad context, and then we're going to apply this to the Hunger Games a bit. So charismatic leadership is necessary in a totalitarian regime meaning that the leader, who the leader is and how the leader presents themselves is very important to the success of that regime. In an in a authoritarian regime, it's not necessarily the case. You might have a leader who's very charismatic, but you don't have to. Highly ideological, well, a totalitarian regime very much is, right? Ideology is part of what a totalitarian regime is presenting. In Nazi German, Germany, what was the ideology of Nazi Germany? What were they presenting? What was the vision of Nazi Germany? Was there any ideology of how the world should be? What was, what was the vision of Nazi Germany? Was it a world of you know, peace and happiness between all races? No, it was building a new kind of master race, right? A German Reich. That's highly ideological. This is something that uh, takes a lot of energy. An authoritarian regime, on the, on the other hand, isn't particularly ideological. 
again, it takes a lot of effort to, to produce ideology and culture, right? It takes energy to do this. Control family and social life. Now this, again, think about this in the context of the Hunger Games. Is this what's going on? Is family and social life being controlled by President Snow and Pan Am and all the districts? Uh, in a totalitarian regime, yes, definitely. Uh, my mother grew up in Nazi Germany, right? And in the schools, you saw pictures of Hitler. And you wrote about Hitler uh, in, in your schools. And when you went home, you were, you were to talk to your parents about what you learned in school about Hitler, right? Totalitarian regimes, control is not just in public. It's also in your private life, kind of deep in your life. Again, an authoritarian regime, that's not the case. That, that's not what's happening. It's more control of kind of the power of the military or the police, but it doesn't really go deep. And this is what I mean by deep legitimacy. You have deep legitimacy if people buy into the ideology, right? People have bought into it. So if things are going well in a totalitarian regime, you have deep legitimacy. People buy into the program. And I'll talk about that, how that coincides with control in a little bit. But in an authoritarian regime, the legitimacy is not deep. It's kind of surface level. And legitimacy really can go off the rails if there's a crisis, right? If, if you're, as an authoritarian ruler, have no ideology to back up your program and the economy sinks, right, there's not much backing up why you should be in power. So ideology is really important in this kind of distinction between totalitarian and authoritarian rule. And this is what I put a 21st century trend, and this is more my take, right? In the 21st century, totalitarian regimes seem to be going down. Who would, what would be a totalitarian regime today? Anyone want to throw out? where it's like crazy totalitarian. There's, yeah. North Korea, right? That's kind of, and even North Korea, we had, a, we had a talk here the other day where there's some cracks in that as well, right? But yeah, you know, but if, you, if I'd asked that same question 50 years ago, what would you have said? Probably the Soviet Union, right? And a lot of other Soviet states, client states. Perhaps Spain, right? If you went back 70, 80 years ago, right? Kind of fascism in Europe, Franco, Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, right? I mean, in, again, in the Soviet Union. But it appears that this totalitarian model, and this is a good thing, right? Seems to be going away. But authoritarianism is not, right? <laughs> it's here. Okay, so let's, that's something to think about in this context. So as I say, authoritarianism is a lot easier than being a totalitarian ruler right? Uh, a good authoritarian ruler basically extracts rents from his people, meaning they take what they didn't earn from a population that can't really get away. <laughs> That's what a good authoritarian ruler does. And they try to minimize how much energy they put into that process. They try to get the most return, right? Meaning how much can I extract from the population that I control without putting too much effort into it. So why bother with ideology, right? It's a lot of work. If you're ideological, what do you have to do with your school system, for example? So let's go back to kind of the Hitler case, right? So what, what is Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union or North Korea? Do they need to have some kind of platform in schools to support the regime? You shake your head, but why? Why is that? Right, and that, that takes energy. You've got to train those teachers, right? It's work. It's work. So why do it? Is President Snow doing this? What is he doing? Is he pr promoting an ideological framework in the Hunger Games? I don't know. I mean, again, I, I'm, I'm throwing this out there as a question. Is there overriding ideology in, in Panem? Yes, what is it? So there is some ideological, right? There's something there. And how is that getting reinforced? In the what? Ah, all right, so there's some media that's part of this, right? So think about totalitarian regimes. I said this is a 20th century phenomenon. You need media to be a good totalitarian ruler. I mean, that's just part of it. Um, so yeah, good insight. And again, I don't know if Snow, at the end of the day, and we can discuss this, is totalitarian or authoritarian. I mean, there's, there's again, there's a little bit of a milky uh, in between here, but let's, let's look at this a bit. Here's another thing about legitimacy and, and why maybe you want to be a totalitarian versus an authoritarian ruler. Any society, right, any society that has people in it has a ruling hierarchical structure that requires a balance of legitimacy and force, 
right? Democratic society. We, what backs up our laws, ultimately? Why do we all decide to be citizens that are going to follow the rules? Just because we're nice? What happens to you when you break the rules here? Why can't, yeah, you get slapped, but ultimately by who or what? If I don't pay my taxes, if I, if I, I, I like to speed, right? But why can't I just put my car at 100 miles an hour and just fly out of here every night? Who what? Who's going who's gonna to keep me from doing that? I live in a democracy, don't I? Can't I do whatever I want? No, there's a state, right? There's, there's, there's a something that has force that can keep me from doing what I want to do, which is not pay my taxes, right? Speed. I don't want to put, you know, admissions on my car. I mean, come on. Why would I do that? Right? But there, there's some kind of force, meaning the state, that keeps order, right? So even in democratic societies. But I want you to think about as an authoritarian or totalitarian society how different this is. If you have really high legitimacy, you often don't have to use force brutally to reassert order. All right? So think of Nazi Germany again at its peak. And I put this picture in here. Huge rally, a Nazi rally. And I'm saying, look, in a period where you have high legitimacy, you don't have to use force to reinforce order. So why is that? Why is it that if you have high legitimacy, you don't have to use force a lot? Yeah. Do they believe in the power, though? Exactly. Therefore, you don't have to bring out the security forces, right? You've already bought in. Okay, so what happens when you lose legitimacy, though? Right? So as legitimacy goes down, force goes up, right? Particularly in a, in a non-democratic society. And this is a really interesting dynamic when you think about the Hunger Games, what's going on in these stories, right? What's happening to Snow and the whole regime? What's happening to legitimacy as we go into this third movie? Is, is the regime increasing its legitimacy? Does everybody, are, are more and more people buying into the program or are there less and less people? You're shaking your head, what's happening then? It's coming down. So what's the response from Pan Am's security forces? Right, so we know we have a crisis of legitimacy that's occurring, right? So how do they enhance it? So what are they, exactly. Did you read this before I did it? Perfect, <laughs> perfect. Well, here's, that's exactly what's happening, right? That we, we, legitimacy has been lost. This authoritarian, or maybe totalitarian, I, you know, again, we can debate it, is reinforcing legitimacy through brutal force, right? And this is what happens in, all, in, it happens in democratic regimes, but a lot less. But, right, any governance structure, when it starts to lose legitimacy, it starts to get violent, right? It asserts its, its authority in really nasty ways. So here's some real life examples in the last couple of years of how this is occurring. Anybody know where some of these, this footage is? Where, where in the world has there been some uprising against authoritarian rule in the last five years? Yeah. Middle East. Yeah, these are all photos from the Arab Spring where police are reasserting authority, right? That, these regimes are losing legitimacy and the state forces, this is particularly police forces, are trying to reassert order, right? So this is when violence really goes up. So again, this is this interesting thing. What do you do as an authoritarian ruler at these points, right? Do you, do you give in or do you become more violent? That's always an interesting dynamic of how, how, you know, how to be a good authoritarian ruler is when do, you, when do you put on the pressure and when do you ease up, right? That's always kind of a dynamic that occurs. And in the Arab Spring, in some places, it backfired. What happens if you keep on beating people? What's happening in the Hunger Games? People are getting mad, right? But what happens if you stop using? Let, let's just kind of think about this. If you just use violence to reassert legitimacy, what, what can that produce? Violence only. Yeah. Yeah. 
right. That's, it's, it's over, right? I mean, at, at some level, um, you lose complete legitimacy, don't you? Because no longer are you benign at, or have any real value. You're just a brute. And let's go to the other extreme. Let's say, let's say you don't use any more violence. Let's say that President Snow basically uses no more violence, just lets things happen. What happens then in, in all the districts? They stop complying. They stop complying. Right? So if you use violence only, that's not good. If you, and, and this is, this is the, in, in a way, the tragic flaw of totalitarian authoritarian rule. You always have to use some violence or some measure of it, right? You can, because if, if you completely back off, you can, things can fall apart quickly as well. So a good authoritarian ruler has this nice balance of violence and reward, carrot and stick as you will, right? And, and this is really important. And again, within the context of 60% of the world's population, that's what's going on quite often. Carrot and stick. So what are other avenues here that we saw in the Hunger Games, right? Obviously, I mean, what's going on uh, with all these things? This, what's the fellow's his name? What's that all about? How might that build legitimacy in, in that society? That whole shenanigan of the TV shows and all that stuff. Yeah. It's kind of funny and happy and light, haha, -ha, glitzy, big teethy smile, right? You know what I'm talking about. Um, Someone talked about the division, right? We know that in, in the capital. What's life like here? Is it a good life? It's certainly presented as one, right? It's, it's what we can produce. That's, that's our best, right? Glitzy, modern, fashion-y. All these things build legitimacy. Uh, and then, of course, just the interaction between a ruler and someone that um, they know threatens them, right? So let's talk a little bit about that. I'm just for time here. I want to move along. Here's our here's President Snow. And one thing again, a, a good totalitarian ruler has is charisma. But I just want to, again, I don't know. I'm not an expert on the games, but maybe people can help me. What is this guy like? Just looking at this pictures. What about him is going to reassert potential legitimacy? Would you buy into this guy? Yes, no. Grandfatherly. Grandfatherly. He's like a crazy Santa, right? <laughs> That's all I think. <laughs> Crazy Santa. I mean, right, would you, you know, warm and fuzzy, right? But he has that father figure, right? What else about him? That might certainly make him more legitimate in, in my belief system. What else? Other than being grandfatherly. He's got a son who's a teacher that you wouldn't want to mess with. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of aggrandize himself, and the more he gets people to sort of go along with that, it kind of builds uh, a critical mass of everybody doing what everybody else does. Yeah. Going along with it. So he's spectacle. I mean, he's also manipulating, obviously, media, right? The, the, he, he says one thing to people inside the Hunger Games, and he's saying something different, obviously, outside. I mean, he's, he's, he's a clever fellow. He's also just handsome, right? I hate to say it, he's more handsome than me. I mean, it doesn't happen often, but what are you going to do? I, but, so, I mean, the guy's hand, I mean, so there's sometimes charismatic leadership is just genetics, and, you know, quite honestly, sometimes too. Um, so this is, this is part of what's going on here. And, and, and of course, a, a good leader is going to manipulate and use that to their advantage as much as possible. But there are other strategies, and uh, let's just think about this. And again, this, this is in the context of the movie that's coming out, so things are starting to get a little... Uh, unsettled, right, in Panama. So this is, this is, this is a, uh, a message from Capital TV to you. Is our great nation... This is Capital TV. Since the dark days, our great nation has known only peace. Ours is an elegant system conceived to nourish and protect. Your districts are the body, the capital, 
is the beating heart. Your hard work feeds us, and in return, we feed and protect you. But if you resist the system, you starve yourself. If you fight against it, it is you who will bleed. I know you will stand with me, with us, with all of us, together, as one. And am today, and am tomorrow, and am forever. Okay. All right, so you talked about carrot and the stick there, right? Uh, what's the message here? Obviously, the, the last message is it's going to last forever. But there's definitely a, initially very positive and then the threat, right? Then the threat. So a good, again, he's, he's reading the tea leaves in a way, right? He's, he, he senses crisis. So this is an important for a good authoritarian ruler. Um, so just to, because uh, of time here, I'm going to move along. If we look at kind of basic lessons from all this, I came up with a couple here to think about. Um, I mean, here, here are uh, some pretty important authoritarian, perhaps totalitarian rulers that are out there. Uh, the president of Syria going left to right, the king of Saudi Arabia, the king of Bahrain, the head of the Chinese Communist Party, President Putin uh, of Russia, head of Iran, right? So all these leaders are pretty important people in, in the context of 21st century politics. And the lessons for them that I would take from the Hunger Games and President Snow are these. Limited violence is most effective, right? You don't use violence all the time. Um, limited violence. You use the media and information censorship, again, selectively. Most of these regimes, including Russia, China, they're not, it's not like everything is completely, uh, you, you have no access to information other than what the government says, but it's very selective. So it's not a complete blackout, but it's a selective one. Charisma matters. You need to make sure you think about how you present things. Uh, identity and the other, and use it to build and maintain legitimacy by the other, meaning find the enemy, right? In Russia, the enemy is the West. In Iran, the enemy is also the West in a slightly different incarnation, right? But find that enemy and, and really exploit it and avoid that totalitarian model. So I don't think Snow has got it right in a way. I think he's too far in the totalitarian direction for long-term security. And, you know, again, I, we'll see where it goes. But uh, that's my take on it. And I just wanted, this I found just pretty interesting, just to finish off. These are protests in Thailand right now against an authoritarian ruler. And what do they got? What, what's that hang signal there? It's the Hunger Games signal, right? So this is actually making its way into real protest movements, which is also pretty interesting. But I'll leave it there. I'm sorry it took so much time, but thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Hibben. That was, that was really interesting, and I'm really glad you played that clip from um, the, this was, that was meant initially as a sneak peek promo for the upcoming film, um, but I, I think it's devastatingly well made, uh, that piece. Um, for our next talk, uh, and I think it segues very nicely with um, Dr. Hibbins, uh, Dr. Katrina Hoop is uh, from the Department of Sociology, and she's going to be looking at another issue which is um, not only pervasive in the books of the Hunger Games and the films, but also of a lot of relevance today. And that is uh, the militarization of American society, uh, lessons learned from Pan Am's peacekeepers. Dr. Katrina Hoop. Thanks. Well, I sort of have to rain on the parade here with my theme. <laughs> it's going to shift a little bit from Dr. Hibbins. Um, so in the Mockingjay, a uh, major theme is the role of the peacekeepers. We know this is a euphemism for this violent and repressive paramilitary police force. And we saw that scene where the man is killed um, after he shows dissent. 
And so, of course, people are very afraid of this force and this police force. Inequality is maintained um, in Panem by police with absolute power. So the topic of authority, or the ability to get people to obey specific commands, has long been a subject of sociological inquiry. This topic was studied by Max Weber, a famous sociologist in Germany writing in 1800s. While he was concerned with the legitimate authority and, dom uh, and domination, which Dr. Hibben just spoke about, uh, when people view those in power with legitimate authority uh, who are elected democratically, the topic of how people are governed has and will continue to be of interest. How do people grant institutions authority for rule? What values does society hold as a collective? So while much research in the field of political science has been done on the militarization around the world, I want to focus on the United States. Most Americans would assume that because we're a democratic country and generally peaceful compared to warring nations, the topic of the militarization uh, does not apply to us. But many would argue that recent trends suggest something quite different. A number of commentators have argued that the war on terror has come home. Furthermore, there are serious consequences to treating communities as war zones. I'll come back and talk about these trends and their consequences. So we don't need to look much further than law enforcement to see how the militarization is impacting communities around the US. Perhaps some of you saw images like this from Ferguson, Missouri last summer. Protesters facing off against police, they're wearing their uh, riot gear, uh, Kevlar vests, helmets, camouflage, they're carrying tear gas, carrying automatic assault rifles, they have their mine resistant armored vehicle behind them. While this is the most recent example of the ramping up of the military state or the militarization of society, this has been going on since the 1960s. According to, according to journalist Radley Balco, he's the author of The Rise of the Warrior Cop, quote, law enforcement agencies across the US at every level of government have been blurring the line between police officer and soldier. Driven by martial rhetoric in the availability of military style equipment from bayonets and M16 rifles to armored personnel carriers, American police forces have, op have often adopted a mindset previously reserved for the battlefield, end quote. During the 1980s and 90s, we saw a resurgence with the war on drugs, and after 9-11, with surplus equipment from the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. According to an analysis by the New York Times, since, 19, uh, since 2006, police departments have received $4.3 billion worth of equipment. This has included 435 armored vehicles, 93,000 machine guns, 432 mine-resistant armored trucks. In addition, the value of military equipment used by these police agencies has increased from 1 million in 1990 to nearly 450 million in 2013. Along with acquiring this hardware, law enforcement agencies have been using more aggressive tactics such as SWAT team deployment, regardless of the situation. This has led to many more fatalities and injuries. According to an American Civil Liberties Union report released recently, 79% of SWAT deployments um, in the years 2011 and 12 were for search warrants, most of them for drugs. The primary argument from law enforcement is that regular policing doesn't work. We hear this despite the reality that crime has fallen to its lowest levels in decades. So the purpose, I'll come back to this topic, um, fatalities and injuries, the purpose of the police is to protect and serve. So what role should they have in terms of enforcing safety? Where is the line drawn? Law enforcement argues uh, that they need special equipment and tactics to ensure safety, and as I mentioned, that regular policing doesn't help. The argument is that chaos will result if deviance and dissent are not squelched. The public opinion is mixed on this um, in terms of where the line should be drawn. The Pew Research Center found that there was a difference across racial groups in looking at the police presence in Ferguson. 65% um, of African American respondents agreed that the police presence in Ferguson had gone too far compared to 32% um, of white respondents. This difference highlights both the gray area in public perception as well as the difference across great racial groups, which I'll come back to. We see the militarization of society in a number of other places besides law enforcement. Military, 
have given universities armored trucks and grenade launchers. We have a lot more metal detectors in places. Closed circuit TV and surveillance cameras are in many public spaces. Facial recognition software for large crowds requiring IDs and security clearance checkpoints. So why should we be concerned about this trend, um, both in society and in, in law enforcement? Um, there's many problematic consequences, and this should give us pause. The first is that um, has to do with the uh, SWAT team deployments and injuries. There was an increase from 3,000 raids nationwide um, in 1980 to approximately 70,000 in 2010. By many accounts, these raids are overreactive and are more likely to result in innocent people being killed, um, including children. Many of the cases um, involving SWAT teams are used for drug raids, and so this seems quite excessive for seizing drugs like marijuana. Uh, a second uh, issue is about dissent in the form of rallies and protests and how they're stifled, how this process is stifling this. In the 1999 Seattle IMF protest, the Seattle's police chief criticized his use of uh, a militarized police force. Ten years later, he admitted that it led to actually more violence. Uh, more recently, we've seen Occupy Wall Street protesters being met with you know, violence, repression, leading to injury. Yet another concern has to do with the impact that police raids have on communities of color. I mentioned uh, racial differences across groups. The ACLU reported that 54% of people impacted by excessive paramilitary-like searches were people of color. This report argues that uh, police target black and Latino communities in their aggressive tactics. Finally, the buildup of weapons and police equipment is a huge industry that doesn't benefit public safety, but the manufacturers of this equipment. Manufacturers benefit directly from our fear that state and local authorities use to justify their tactics and action, actions. Two international events that highlight the relationship between militarization and profit are the Olympics and the World Cup. The International Olympic Committee requires cities around the world to spend millions on security. During the London Olympics in 2012, Britain had over 13,000 military personnel on patrol, their, mi their biggest military buildup since World War II. In addition to these personnel, they acquired surface-to-air missiles. Similarly, Brazil spent almost $1 billion on security, including RoboCop-style uniforms. They militarized the public space for the recent World Cup. Local community groups were met with violent repression when they protested the existence of the World Cup in the Brazilian government before the start of the games. While, of course, we should be concerned with safety and security, this process does beg the question, at what cost? We should continue to ask ourselves, what is the motivating force behind the militarization of society and the police force? Who is benefiting and how? What role does fear play in our acquiescence to this trend? These are all questions I hope we continue to ask. Thanks. Thank you, Katrina, for that excellent talk um, and a lot of very provocative food for thought. We'd like to have um, our last speaker this evening uh, come up and speak a bit more for, um, of the, about the Hunger Games from their cinematic perspective. And that's going to be Professor John Hofstadter from Communications speaking on Knock Knock, changing the narrative punchline to ash, add fresh perspectives on a dystopian society. So it's John Hofstadter. That is one scary photo. I think I'm going to start out by asking. I think I'm going to start out by asking everybody a question. Knock, knock. I'm not going to answer that quite yet. Um, everybody knows knock-knock jokes, right? We tell them all the time, right? We're growing up, knock-knock this, knock-knock that. 
Some are funny, some are stupid, some are probably inappropriate. But here, in the context of working with a film that is extremely successful and a book series that is wildly popular, um, how do you kind of work this through, where now all of a sudden everybody knows the joke, but the punchline can change every time? And that's really kind of what we're going to be talking about here. So we're looking at sort of changing this narrative punchline in the context of like this very, very popular film and still get the same kind of message across. Books are big, the first film is big, and now we've seen the second film and we can take it from there. We know the story, but we have a different kind of punchline to play. So let's take a look at this for a second, right? How big is this? 2008 Hunger Games, uh, then going on to Catching Fire, and then finally Mocking Jay, the last book out. This is how things looked for us, right? Publication success, 100 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. USA Today bestseller list, 17 and a half million copies sold. That's unbelievable. Absolutely phenomenal. And um, she is now the best-selling Kindle author ever. Other books, 10 million for Catching Fire, 9 million for Mockingjay. That's a boatload of books. Films come out, right? First one that comes out, March of 2012, Highest grossing non-sequel film. Now it's a sequel, right? Because we have more. But this was the first one. Highest grossing ever. 700 million total international box office receipts. Right? That's like close to a billion dollars, right? It's absolutely amazing how successful these things have become. Here's the second film, Catching Fire, last year. Released November. That's when we had our first panel. Thank you very much, Michelle. 864 million, that's even more than the first one. Highest grossing film of 200 and, 213, sorry, 2013. 10th highest grossing film ever. And you know what's interesting too, uh, Lionsgate, the company that put this out, this, they were about to go bankrupt and this put them out, pulled them out of bankruptcy. Um, and it was the highest grossing film they ever released. And what's really interesting too is that these, films, these books have a very strong female lead. Basically, she's the protagonist. And it's very rare, especially in films, that a very big female lead is in a blockbuster film. I mean, this thing is huge. The last time there was, in a blockbuster film, a female lead, anybody have any, venture any guess? Alien was got a strong female lead. Not a huge blockbuster, though. Yeah, I like that. Here we go. This was the last one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Linda Hamilton, right? Linda Hamilton in The Exorcist. It's like, oh my God. But let's let's sort of. Stick with somebody a little more current here, right? Jennifer Lawrence uh, as uh, Katniss, who is our, our heroine, our hero, our protagonist in the story, right? We've got her, right? We've seen her in a film. We've seen her in two films. This, and I'm going to be looking at the Catching Fire a little bit here. Um, we know her from the books. She's right, pretty cool stuff, right? She's very cool stuff. How do you make this story different? better, more interesting. I mean, we know she's going to like, you know, kick butt and take names later. Um, so what do we do? How, how can we pull this together? Well, the problem is that success breeds film familiarity, right? We know this, right? How do we like take all this together and then present it in a new, interesting and exciting way, right? Well, we know the storyline, powerful and corrupt state, right? They manipulate, they control the powerless masses and to remain in power. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to stay in power. Authoritarian, totalitarian, through violence, 
through militarization, that's how they do that. But what can we do as storytellers? Well, you know, we've got our heroine, our heroine here. She is big stuff. She's a big star, as star power goes. She's in a lot of great stuff. What if we turned her into a sex goddess? What if we said, hey, let's give her some cleavage, let's give her some this and that and the other thing, let's play that card. Well, they kind of did in a way, in some, in some cases. What if we turned her into an action hero? You know, running, jumping, skipping, shooting, killing, that's action hero stuff. And you know, yeah, they kind of did that, right? Arrows here and, you know, that kind of stuff. It was pretty amazing. What if we turned her into a heartthrob? Let's give her some romance. Let's give her a little bit of, you know, relationship power. <laughs> Forget the arrows. The arrows of the heart, maybe. Something like that. So these are all things that can happen. And what's really kind of interesting is this. Um, the way a lot of films work successfully is that they deal with two different paradigms. One is that they allow us or they give us permission to look inside ourselves at our own personal internal truths. Like, who am I? Like, why am I like this? And, you know, it really makes you think about yourself. But they also allow us to look outside ourselves and where we fit in our world, in our society. I'm here, I'm me, and there's all this other stuff out there too. So where does that fit? And the beauty of working in the Hunger Games is that it combines both of those in a very nice and a very creative way. Where Katniss's internal struggles are really those external things as well, her in the bigger context of the world, when she's battling against the state, against the, the, the power of Panem, if you will. So she's looking internally, but man, it has so much more than that. When there's poverty and hunger, right, it's forced upon her and the people by the state. When there's love, right, well, we have actually two kind of stories going on here, right? The love that the state prescribes, right? This is your partner and we will prance you about on TV. Everybody knows it, very much um, media centric or the real love that is there. She has to deal with motherhood and sisterhood as well here. I have to be a good sister and mother figure. And I have to address it. I have to deal with that and come to grips with that. Where do I fit in? And she also has to internally come to that place where she becomes empowered. She's no longer a victim, but she now, through a lot of her, her guile, if you will, and, and her will, she takes us to a place where she can now start to exercise that empowerment. That's pretty cool stuff, and that's pretty important. There's an interesting um, article back in 1970, uh, a feminist author, um, Carol Hanisch, published this article about um, the personal and the political and the personal being political. And it came about from discussions back in the early feminist movement where um, women would gather together um, in a living room or whatever it happened to be, and they talk about issues that they had, the problems that they had about being a woman and how they could better themselves, where they could fit within um, the context of society and how I can you know, sort of empower myself to do that. And there was um, a discussion within that community saying, you know, this is just therapy. This is like, you know, this isn't going to lead anywhere. 
You know, you're just basically talking about your problems. It's going to be like a, a therapy session, basically. And what um, uh, Hanish was saying was that, no, as a matter of fact, that's not true. Because what you deal with personally in your own life, and again, this is in the context of the feminist movement, as a woman can empower others. And that's kind of where this came about. Your own personal struggles can parallel the injustice of the world. The things that you are struggling against, other people do as well. What you feel, others feel on a global scale. In other words, you're not alone. There are other people that share what you share. And that's OK. And when you change, and grow, everybody else will too. Because they'll see that growth, they'll see that empowerment, and they, in turn, will find strength in that. What a concept. Taking the personal to the political. So really what you're trying to do is this. The greater understanding of yourself, the more you look inside, the more you can understand the world out there. I'm dealing with my stuff here, but that reflects out in the world. That's some pretty heavy, heavy stuff up there. When you understand that, that's when things can happen. That's when you can create the change. Taking that personal moment, taking those personal things and putting them out there. Here's one person that did it, right? She had a really big struggle. It was a personal one, right? She didn't want to sit in the back of the bus anymore. And so she sat in the front, and it really caused an entire movement to happen. It was the spark that ignited the civil rights movement, Rosa Parks. She took that, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. Forget it. I'm sitting up front. And boom. It happened. A very powerful moment. Because she took that internal moment and it went external. Now, in the Hunger Games here, Katniss's personal struggles are basically everyone's struggles. What she goes through, everyone goes through, right? I live here, it's in poverty, I might get called up, I might be a tribute, I'm going to have to kill people or get killed. And that, I mean, it's like everybody feels that. The thing about Katniss is that she sees her personal struggle in the context of the political. She knows that what she does is going to affect everybody, and that is really empowering. That is very empowering. And as she resolves those struggles, so does Panem, or the people, the citizens of Panem. So think about it for a second. And think about you. Think about where you're at. Think about what personal issues, struggles, those things that you have. They're everybody's. Everybody's got them. Somewhere, somehow. And when you overcome them, everybody can, because you have. So where do you begin? How do you start? You know? Where do you want to begin that process of addressing, thinking about those personal things and having them become political? It's pretty cool stuff. It's pretty cool stuff. Now, on another note, we're going to take this sort of in a, a different spin here at the end. I've got two clips I'm going to show. One is, um, and these are uh, both from Catching Fire. And um, the first one is uh, where Katniss, the character Katniss, Jennifer Lawrence, she um, is really starting to understand and to uh, appreciate her 
sort of her lot here. And she's um, starting to understand her, her empowerment, if you will. She can see what's going on here. She's learning, she's growing, and her eyes are opening as she goes along. And this is a scene right after a guy gets shot uh, because she was addressing a crowd and you know they were kind of protesting, they were putting up that symbol. So let's play this thing, if I can get this thing to work properly. There we go. And let's see what that is. Woody Harrelson is in this, an odd choice of casting, but he plays it really well, and he comes out with probably the most appropriate line here. So let's see what we can do. Shut up. Oh my God. You two have a very simple task. I never meant for anyone to get killed. He has to know that. What are you talking about? Who has to know what? Snow, he came to see me. He's worried about rebellion in the districts. He thinks that they don't believe our love story. So he wants you to make them believe it? I'd calm things down. You know, Candace, you should have told me that before I went out there and tried to give these people the money. I'm sorry, I didn't know what to do. He threatened to kill my family. Well, I have family too. Okay, people that I need to protect. What about them? Who protects them? Goodness, what were you thinking? I was thinking about Rue. David, please, please just help me get through this trip. Please just help us get through this. This trip, girl, wake up. This trip doesn't end when you get back home. You never get off this train. You two are mentors now. That means that every year they're gonna drag you out and broadcast the details of your romance. Every year, your private life becomes theirs. From now on, your job is to be a distraction so people forget what the real problems are. So what do we do? You're gonna smile, you're gonna read the cards that Effie gives you, and you're gonna live happily ever after. Think you can do that? Huh? Yeah. Your job is to, to distract people from what's really bad, what's really bad in their lives. Um, Woody Harrelson delivers a lot of good lines in this thing, and, um, but it's interesting to hear that from one of the characters. And it's also kind of interesting to have that be sort of an exposition into the very ending of this film, um, Catching Fire, because there is a huge huge plot twist at the very end. If anybody have seen the films, um, you know what that plot twist is. If you haven't, I'm just curious, who has seen Catching Fire? I'm just curious, yeah, and who hasn't seen it? Okay, spoiler alert then, I'll give you a warning here. Um, but anyways, it, it's a way that we're being slowly led along this path to something kind of interesting here at the very end, you know? I mean, we're, Woody Harrelson helping him along and doing all this kind of stuff, warning about this, that, and the other thing. Um, we're gonna go to one more clip that also is gonna do this. Now, this is kind of interesting um, because this is a clip where um, the character played by Philip Seymour Hoffman, um, who is no longer with us, um, is dancing with Katniss, our heroine. And <clears throat> as you watch this clip, um, you will might feel a little unease, like something kind of weird and wacky is happening here. And I remember the first time I saw it, I was thinking, you know, is this just really lousy filmmaking or what? But it's really kind of interesting. And, and I guess I should preface it by saying that what we're going to be looking at here, what we're going to be talking about just at the very end quickly, is something that uh, um, people who shoot video and film um, have to deal with all the time. It's called a 180 degree rule. In other words, when you shoot two people on the screen, you always want to keep them on the same side of the frame of the picture that you see there. No matter where the camera is, you have to keep them on the same side because what happens is that if you don't and they flip sides, things get really weird. So watch what happens in this clip, okay? I'm going to get all the stuff more in. Katniss! Pizza! This! is Plutarch Heavensby, head game maker, successor to Seneca Crane. It's a, it's a fact to follow. Pizza! <laughs> May I? Please. So how do you like the party? It's a little overwhelming. It's appalling. 
still, if you abandon your moral judgment, it can be fun. So are you having fun? I'm the head game maker. Fun is my job. I thought that was what happened to Seneca Crane. Too much fun. Seneca decided to quit breathing. Decided. Is that or poison berries? Being head game maker has never been the most secure job in the world. Then why are you here? Same reason as you. I volunteered. Why? Ambition. A chance to make the games mean something. The games don't mean anything. They only mean to scare us. Well, maybe it was you who inspired me to come back. Ah, the presidential welcome. I'm sure we'll meet again. We'll meet again. Yes, we will meet again. Um, but check this out, seriously, what's interesting here is this. This is sort of fr from a filmmaker's perspective and from an audience's perspective too, is that as we see these guys dancing around, yes, the camera's kind of going around and they're kind of like dancing around doing their foxtrot or their waltz, but you'll notice also at the cuts that they switch positions. They completely switch positions in the frame, right? So if we're looking at Jennifer Lawrence on here, and there's a cut, all of a sudden that's Philip Seymour Hoffman right there. Now, if you were a film editor, you'd probably be fired <laughs> because that's really bad filmmaking. So why the heck with you know, a $100, $200 million budget would they do something that silly and that crazy? Well, think about this for a second. And what I tend to do a lot of times is I'll Turn the audio all the way off, and I'll play something just so I can look at it. But really, when they start dancing and when they start talking, it's, you know, Philip Seymour Hoffman has a character of kind of a being a baddie. He's the kind of guy that sort of organizes the whole games, right? So he says, yeah, people are going to die by this way or that way or the other thing. And now all of a sudden he's dancing with Katniss, and we get the sense from their conversation that he's kind of like, don't mess with me, I know what's going on. And she's like kind of being a little feisty and saying, you know, it's all a joke, it's all fake and all that kind of stuff. But now when we see these edits, when we see these cuts here, we see that really, as they dance around and we're looking at one or the other, and then all of a sudden when it does cut, it's the other person. And you'll see it, I think a couple of times here. So there's one. And again, it's considered really bad editing, but when it's done on purpose, it's usually done for a reason. So they flip sides. So what we're doing here, I think there might be one more, there we go, yep. So really what we're doing here is that in a way, what the filmmakers are doing is giving us a little bit of a heads up here, right? In other words, I'm looking at Jennifer Lawrence and boom, it's Philip Seymour Hoffman. They're almost one in the same. Or if you will, maybe they're one in the same side. Just by a simple dance and just by very creative editing. By using a filmmaker technique that allows the audience to maybe not necessarily go, oh, that's happening, but to put that little seed in your mind that maybe there's going to be something that's going to be coming up that I don't know about. And that's exactly what happens at the end of this film without spoiling it for those who haven't seen it. So there. So in conclusion, knock, knock. You're welcome. And thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Hofstadter.
Um, on that note, uh, I'd like to invite the panelists to come up and um, entertain maybe some questions from uh, the audience regarding their presentations. In the meantime, perhaps while, yes, if you would, uh, I mean, perhaps while they're setting up, um, I'd like to introduce Catherine Cody uh, from the Mercy Center. And um, it's interesting to think about that the Hunger Games are named after hunger. It's something that's sort of thrown in there. And Susan Collins doesn't develop it more than to sort of say that basically you can, the, the, the youth that get drawn and um, their names drawn as tributes can acquire more food for their families who are starving by putting their names more than once into the lottery. Um, and that makes these populations um, in many ways doubly vulnerable. And so it gets us thinking about uh, hunger, and this is um, Hunger and Homelessness Week, and there's a series of uh, activities that the Mercy Center is offering that uh, Catherine will tell us about. Great. Well, thank you so much, and thank you to the speakers for um, some really wonderful presentations. Um, as Dr. Laughlin was saying, it is Hunger and Homeless Awareness Week, and something that really has struck me about the Hunger Games is that um, you notice in some of the districts that hunger is such an issue that, you know, there is that um, play on putting your, putting your name into the games. Um, and it's not because there isn't enough hunger, but it's because of the society and the system that they live in, um, which, you know, causes me then to reflect on our, um, the situation in America. Obviously, there is hunger and homelessness that is present in America, but we can't say that it is because there is not enough food in America and not enough space to live in, um, but really a result of the cycle of poverty that exists. Um, so I certainly um, am glad to see so many people here tonight, and I invite you to take part in a lot of different things that are happening through the Mercy Center this week, different opportunities to serve. Um, uh, tomorrow at St. Vincent de Paul in Portland, and Wednesday at Catherine's Cupboard, Thursday at the Root Cellar in um, Lewiston, and on Friday in the Preble Street Resource Center in Portland, as well as an opportunity on Thursday to come together as a community uh, in a Thanksgiving prayer service here in the auditorium at four. Um, so thank you for your time, and I'll let you ask these wonderful presenters some more questions. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Uh, and I, we do have some microphones so that if, um, that I, and I think um, the cultural affairs, if they would move those around as necessary. As I, that, that's how I understood it. Okay. <laughs> um, and so therefore, if, if you have a question um, to any of our presenters, please feel free to um, raise your hand and we will bring a mic right over to you so that we can, uh, everyone can hear your question. And um, we look forward to responding. Don't let this intimidate you. Uh, thanks to all three of you. Uh, There's a question for John. I'd, I'd never heard the origin of the phrase, the personal is political, before. And I found that interesting because I've always, um, I've always experienced that phrase as worrisome, as the political dominating on the personal, so that there's really little left of privacy and, and personal, which to me, it was interesting that you saw this as empowering for Katniss, because to me it seems like she's not empowered, she's burdened. She just really wants to live a normal life um, as a young woman and is not allowed that, and, and it's really, it's empowering in that she does have power that threatens the, the regime, but, but the way she experiences it as I read the book, or I read the first book and saw the, the movies, um, th this, is, uh, this is a threat to her, to her well-being. So I'm interested in your, in your take on that, but um, do you see the personal as political as also having this other sort of dark side that, that it threatens to swamp the, the personal so that you can't, buy a cup of coffee without thinking about the political ramifications and messages that you're, that you're potentially sending out. Say things about that. Yes, one could consider that. 
Um, yeah, I take a look at that, um, I think, yeah, on a much more positive level and um, looking at sort of where that phrase came from and, and how it was originally proposed, it seemed to fit well with Katniss, it really did. And uh, where she was sort of realizing that even in her own personal life, right, when it comes to love, when it comes to her family, when it comes to all these people that are being affected directly by her on a personal level, that she has a choice to make um, when it comes to addressing the big political picture because of those choices. So I, I think, but you know, I, I think there is valid, validity in that whole idea about being completely oppressed by a powerful state when it comes to your personal life. So, you can. Thank you. Just in the field. Yeah. So just in the field of political science, right? The the idea of um, kind of like almost interesting about totalitarian regimes, right? Where they enter into into the private life of people, right? So there's kind of a divided political science, anyways, between looking at politics and the formal, like voting, right? And then really getting into the personal, and that as you move toward the personal, it gets more into critical theory, right? So. Um, in poli sci, anyways, there's an ongoing debate of where do you draw that line, right? So that's just an issue, another thing that kind of comes out of this discussion I was thinking of, right? That at some level, if everything is political, what isn't, <laughs> in a way, right? Is there, then, then politics means nothing if everything is political, right? Doesn't it? Just in a way. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of, it, it's, it's kind of this, on the other hand, I think the, historically, the political has not been the personal, right? It has been, it's been men voting, or doing diplomacy, and everything else is kind of not. Well, everything else is the private sphere, and we don't worry it's about minimized. it. It's minimized, right? So that's kind of that's where the debate I think comes from, right? And this is a feminist position, right? That so somewhere in there, I don't know. There's a balance, I would think. Yeah. Did you all know that Katniss got her name from our own? Katrina Hoop, yeah, Kat Hoop. Yeah. This is also for Johnson. I mean, uh, the the I think about movies that really speak to people. So, is there a conscious effort by these the directors to actually make this um, multifaceted, right? Because certainly, right, you can be attracted to the sex goddess or the adventurer or whatever those those archetypes are. But it seems to me that. I'm always complaining about you know digital animation, which usually looks terrible, and then millions of dollars are spent, but the story sucks, <laughs> if I can be so frank, right? But here's something where you actually have an interesting story, an adventure, and all this, but there's something deeper. So, I don't know, who, who directed the movie? Oh, man, his name was Lawrence, too. He, his, uh, yes, um, yeah. Yeah, he mostly came from music videos. So, I mean, at some level, is there a conscious process of thinking through those deeper levels do you think that's going into this or was this just random I don't know is it entertainment or is there something more yeah, or just thoughtful, thoughtful yeah. I mean yeah. It, it just it draws me into the story if it is the human kind of very kind of mundane at some level very profound tension right yes and one of the things that, and especially in the beginning in my presentation, um, sort of tongue-in-cheek throwing up a picture of the exorcist, um, you know, a strong female lead in a film is a rare thing. It's a very rare thing. It doesn't happen very often. And to not only have a strong female lead in this film without it being um, exploited or exploitative um, is pretty awesome, I think. And to see her a very intelligent, strong, passionate, compassionate um, woman in a role like this, it's like never happens, never happens. And so um, watching how the director and how, how um, the film company um, takes us into sort of the next level is always interesting. I have a bit of a question maybe. Uh, I thought that that inclusion of the picture of Rosa Parks was really effective, tremendously effective, because it brought us back to our own story and our own history. But I was also reminded of the fact that Rosa Parks was not the first person to protest in that way. And now there's new books out about people who did that before. 
And it reminds me of the fact that um, so much of life has to do with timing. And uh, I suppose that the effectiveness of Rosa Parks was that she did that at just about the same time that a young preacher named Martin Luther King was uh, in the community and about to take uh, action. So maybe both to Mark and to Kat, uh, you mentioned legitimacy and you mentioned Ferguson. What's going to happen in Ferguson if things get out of control in the next few days? What will that say about legitimacy and about where we're at? I'm not sure. Um, do you mean in terms of like how they're going to, you know, what could the, res the consequences are? Sure, you can run with it however you like. <laughs> But what does that say about uh, our legitimacy? Because if things do get out of control, the governor has already promised that he's not going to uh, abide by violence this time. Right, yeah, it raises all kinds of questions about the social contract, you know, how do people perceive, you know, uh, a force that's supposed to protect you, you know, and safety. So I'm not sure, I, I was thinking about um, the role of the media in all this. and you know, how they present what's going on and how the public, you know, we only have a bit, we only have a certain space for national events in our lives, speaking of the, the personal life versus sort of the public life. So it will be interesting to see how, you know, what, you know, if people are paying attention as it fits into everything else that we're focusing on, you know, what the media does say about it or how does it, you know, how do they present it? So I'm not sure, but I think that, um, I think the media is important you know, plays an important role in here. I mean, this isn't supposed to happen in a democracy, right? I mean, you're not supposed to have people with, right, these, the picture that you had in your presentation, Kat, right? I mean, it's a, that's supposed to happen in those authoritarian regimes. What's going on? So the narrative is really hard to kind of square, right, with a democracy. So I, I, I do think this might be pretty big about legitimacy. Um, one thing that is also interesting, that images that, like, uh, Kat had on for her presentation has brought the political far left and far right together on around the militarization of the police. I mean, people are really concerned about this. So I think, yeah, I think it's a great question. If we see those same people that looked, you know, like paratroopers beating people up, I, it does say a lot about, okay, how legitimate is this form of, of repression, right? And the democratic governance structure that's supposed to control that. <laughs> so I think it's a great question. To comment on, I am concerned about this strong sort of nimbyism, right? Not in my backyard. If it doesn't happen to me, I'm okay. You know, I don't care what happens out there to those people. And so I'm worried about sort of individualism taking over this sort of sense of, you know, um, you know, I, what I'm concerned about is in my community. I, I trust the police. They treat me well. So that's this deviant group. So I am concerned about that. Um, in a lot of different topics, but this in particular too. Any last questions? Any? Well, um, thank you all so much for coming. I firstly thank, I'd like to thank our panelists, um, Dr. Hibben, Dr. Katrina Hoop, and uh, John Hofstetter for presenting uh, such um, very insightful uh, and um, provocative and thought-provoking uh, approaches to the Hunger Games books and films get us thinking about how that relates um, not only is the the personal political and vice versa but to what degree is is the fictional as well um, and uh, I would like to invite you all to join us for some light refreshments that will be held up on the, the second floor lounge. And again, uh, thank you for coming out tonight and learning a little bit more about what the Hunger Games means and mastering the Mockingjay. Thank you. Thank you.